and write out a complete explanation, we must define terms. I remember in my first year in philosophy in, in college, my first semester, the first thing we talked about is before you can do anything, you have to define terminology. Because if we're both talking about epistemology and we have two different definitions for it, we're not going to get on very well in our debate. We've got to define our terms. And this is, look at what we see here. We know love by this. By what? By God's word. By God's example. God is love. Yes. Okay. But God also struck down all of Egypt. God is just. Yes. But He also pardoned Rahab. Do you see? So if you're going to talk about the love of God, you can't go to Oprah or Joel Osteen. You've got to go to Scripture. Okay? So now he says, We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us. I've written here countless men of literature, poets, and scholars alike have long attempted to both define and illustrate the nature of love. On the cross, Christ made their works obsolete. With His death, He defined, created, and proclaimed a love whose purity is only matched by its zeal. Through Him we come to know the very essence and meaning of love. His death, for his people is the gold standard. You know, one of the things that after I became a Christian, that really some answers that, that came was this. I would sit there in philosophy class and I would get so mad. I mean, I was a drunken heathen, but I would get mad because I'd hear all these people talk about all this virtue and all these things, but I'd sit there and go, Okay, show it to me. Part of it I used just to justify my own wickedness. But anytime someone started talking about, you know, the virtue of this or the virtue of that or what is true love and what is virtue and what is morality, anytime someone came up with some kind of beautiful thing that they wrote down, I'd say, yeah, but show it to me. When you ask God that, He points to the cross of Calvary. I'll show it to you. Here it is. Herein is love. This is it. You want to know what it looks like? This is what it looks like. Now, Albert Barnes writes, By this we know what true love is. We see a most affecting and striking illustration of its nature. Charles Spurgeon writes, all sorts of sacrifices may be taken as proofs of affection, but the relinquishment of life is the supreme proof of love, which nobody doubts. Thomas Manton, there was power discovered in the creation when God made us like Himself out of the dust of the ground, but love in our redemption when He made Himself like us. The person that was to work out our deliverance was the eternal Son of God, that God who owes nothing to man and was so much offended by man and that stood in no need of man, having infinite happiness and contentment in himself that he should come and die for us, whereby perceive we the love of God. I've written a few things here as essentials that must be properly understood if we're to ever perceive the magnitude of Christ's love. These are things that are absolutely essential. One, the infinite greatness of the one who died. On the cross, it was not man for man, but God for man. The Creator condescends to die for the creature. All right. Now, in your preaching, you don't have much time to do this if you're preaching a weak revival. You don't have much time to do this if you're preaching for your entire life in the same church. But you must labor toward giving the people a high view of God. They will never understand the love of God unless they have a high view of God. 
unless they see the infinite worth of God. Secondly, the depravity, destitution, and misery of the ones for whom Christ died. It would have been unspeakable love if Christ had died for angels or good men or even penitent sinners, but He died for hardened enemies. Now think about this. It would have been amazing, Spurgeon points this out, it would have been amazing if after we had fallen and entered into the greatest corruption, it would have been an amazing on Christ's behalf if all of us had gotten together and asked Him to want Him to come and die for us. We didn't even want His salvation. We wanted nothing to do with Him. It would have been an absolute amazing thing of grace if all of us had gotten together in one huge committee and petitioned God to send down His Son to die for us. But when He sent His Son to die for us, we got angry. I mean, think about this. Three, the severity of the death that was suffered. The cross itself was known to be the greatest of all, but a common one. All other crosses combined are a small thing compared to His, for He died under the wrath of God. It is only when these three truths are properly understood that Christ's death is properly appraised. Men do not properly appraise Christ's death because they don't understand it because it's not being preached. It's not enough to say just Jesus died. As a preacher, you must explain, explain. And please, nothing wrong with, with speaking about the, that Christ suffered. Please, if you make that the epitome of injustice, you can talk about on, on, on East Sunday is nails of thorns. You do not understand the cross, my friend. It is Christ dying in our law place, bearing our guilt, crushed under the wrath of His own Father. Since the death of Christ is the greatest and truest demonstration of love, it must be that love is its author and the force behind it. It was not human merit or virtue that moved Christ to give Himself so freely, but it was unmerited and unconditional love. Now, If I could go back in all my preaching and change things, and there are things that need to be changed, I would lay down such a dark path, such a dark picture of sinners. I would still do that. I would lay down a high view of God but I would have finished many of my sermons with a greater, greater cry of the love of God for men. Not only because it is true, not only because I believe it is correct, but also, know this, accusations against us that we speak too hard about man. But those accusations will be erased if after we have done so, we will speak much about the love of God for men, for men to come to Christ. Do that. Do that. Don't make simply preaching against sin your end. Make it the means to an end to convince men of their need of God, and then assure men of the power of Christ to save. Much of this I learned honestly while I was in Holland because I saw the right thing